Section 1 of Stories from the Adirondacks by Albert A. Young. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roger Moline. Stories from the Adirondacks by Albert A. Young. Section 1 The Mysterious Lake or the hermit of blue ridge part one discovery of the hermit early in life it was a great pleasure to the writer to ramble in the woods among the adirondack mountains in which i was born and brought up in search of game of various kinds roots oars etc my father was an old woodsman and trapper and this taste for hunting was a natural inheritance in me. Many is the day that I have tramped over Blue Ridge with my gun on my shoulder and my faithful dog, Nero, at my heels. And many is the evening that I have returned home, bringing with me numerous fine trophies in the shape of animals of the smaller order, birds, ginseng roots, etc. In fact, so much had I traveled the woods through that I began to think there was not a square rod of land in the whole Adirondack region that I did not know the exact location of. But I was yet to learn that I was mistaken. I had often heard my father speak of a tradition that was handed down from the early settlers of the vicinity that somewhere on the top of Blue Ridge there was a lake, the water of which was as clear as a crystal, and contained or rather was running over, with trout of a fabulous size. Many efforts had been made to discover this lake, but all in vain, as the outlet ran underground, and so could not be traced by this source. So thoroughly had I explored the vicinity of where this lake was supposed to be, that I was convinced that there was no such body of water, set the matter down as some old settler's yarn, and if it ever came up as a topic of conversation in my presence, laughed it to scorn. Years passed by. I gave up my old pursuits of hunting and went to New York City, where I secured a situation in the mercantile business, and in the new scenes and experiences through which I passed, I forgot many of my boyhood's happy days, and also about the tradition of the lost lake on Blue Ridge in the land I left behind me. It was only a few years ago that I returned from the city to my old home nestling among the evergreen mountains. Harry Armstrong, who was employed with me in New York and who had become a fast friend of mine, came home with me as my guest. I had not been back many days when the old desire came over me, and I longed to take a tramp in the woods over the ground that my feet had so often trod in former days. I mentioned this desire to Harry one morning, and asked him to go with me for a day's gunning in the woods on top of old Blue Ridge, which was about a five miles walk from my home. Harry readily consented, as he was struck with the novelty of a tramp in the forest, and so we made some hasty preparations, and with our shotguns started out. Before going, Harry took care to put in a quart bottle of Mum's Extra Dry with our lunch. Harry, I may add, was rather too fond of this beverage. We passed through pastures in which gentle cows were peacefully feeding, through fields in which the golden grain was waving, and in about an hour's time came to the edge of the woods at the foot of the ridge. Pausing in our walk for a few minutes, we took first a good pull at Harry's bottle, and then a look behind us at my home in the distance, and resuming our tramp, we were soon climbing the rugged sides of the mountain, looking around us on all sides for birds or game of any kind. As we traveled on, I recognized many familiar landmarks and places which I used to visit in my former trips through the region. 
frightened from their hiding places various kinds of small game, banged away at some with more or less success in bringing them down, and when noon came we halted to rest and eat our lunch by the side of a little spring which bubbled up out of the earth. After eating we lighted our pipes, and reclining under some sturdy maples, settled down for a few minutes of comfort. It was a day in early September. The sun shone bright and warm, flies were buzzing in the air, and birds sang sweet songs in the branches over our heads. As we smoked away, we began to get drowsy. Soon our eyelids felt heavy, our pipes fell from our mouths, and we were fast asleep. One, two, three, four hours passed slowly away, and still we slept. A fifth had almost passed when I awoke with a start, jumped up, and looked around me. Harry was still sleeping. I looked at the sun and saw that it was hanging over the horizon, lacking but a short time of setting. I looked at my watch and saw that it was getting late. Walking over to where my companion was lying, I grabbed hold of him, gave him a shake and a twitch, which had the double effect of awakening him and bringing him on to his feet. "'Come,' I said. "'Hurry up and let's get started for home. What fools we have made of ourselves sleeping like that, when we are here in the wilderness among bears, catamounts, and who knows what else. Many miles from home and the sun almost set." "'I can't help it,' drawled he, rubbing his eyes. "'Where's the bottle?' I assured him that it was safe, and I picked up our duffel and started off in the direction of home, casting, as I went, many anxious glances toward the rapidly setting sun. Harry followed me. We had proceeded but a short distance when, from out of a thicket to our immediate right, there burst forth a large black bear. Accustomed as I was in my youthful days to seeing such sights, I was not much startled. But Harry saw it, and giving a yell of terror, he darted past me and started off through the wood at the top of his speed. I shouted to him to stop, but he heeded not. Fearing he would get out of my sight and lost, I ran after him and tried to catch up with him to restrain him by means of my strength, if not of my voice. But on he flew, and in spite of my best efforts I could not overtake him, but managed to keep him in sight. On, on we ran, the pursued and the pursuer, dodging among the trees, jumping over old logs, rocks, and other obstacles in our way, until finally Harry disappeared from my sight behind a clump of alders and small brush. I rushed onward, reached the place where I saw him disappear, parted the brush, leaped through, and came to a sudden stop. At my side stood Harry trembling with fear and exhaustion, and right before us stretched out, I should say, two miles long and fully half of that distance wide, hemmed on all sides by the unbroken wilderness, was as beautiful a sheet of water as I ever saw in my life. Out on its surface, about fifty rods from shore, was a rough scow boat, and seated in it was an old man, with long gray hair hanging down his back, which was turned toward us, and he was intently engaged in fishing. I stood gazing in amazement at this scene, which had so suddenly presented itself to my view. Where was I? Surely I must be on Blue Ridge, but that body of water? Then it suddenly flashed upon my mind that I had accidentally stumbled upon the lost lake of the tradition of my forefathers. But who was that old man? I spoke to Harry, and he in the boat heard me and turned quickly around toward us, peering sharply in our direction. 
I stepped out in plain view of him and motioned him to come ashore. He looked intently at me for a moment, and then gathered up his fishing tackle, took up his oars, and commenced rowing slowly toward us. When at a distance of about five rods from shore, he came to a stop, and in a voice of stern authority he asked, "'Who are you who thus trespass on my domain?' "'We are your friends, I trust,' I replied. "'We are from the settlement, and while roaming in these woods we lost our way and have accidentally come to this spot. If you can show us some route that we can take and get back home, we will be very grateful to you.' The old man did not speak until some moments had passed, but seemed lost in thought. When he again addressed us, it was in a gentler tone. "'You are many miles from any habitation, save my own,' he said. "'And the sun is already set. Darkness will soon fall upon the land. Think not of going home to-night, but accept of my hospitality until the morrow.' then go your way and forget that you ever saw me or this place come stand not there but get into my boat and go with me to my mansion over there and he smiled and pointed across the water we complied with his request got into the boat which while we were talking he had pulled up to the shore and were soon gliding over the water going in the direction of the east end of the lake we soon reached our destination, and the old man secured his boat and led the way into the forest. We followed, and soon came to a cabin among the trees. This we entered, the old man struck a light, built a fire in a rude stove, and set to work to prepare some supper. Harry and myself sat down on a bench built against the wall, and entered into conversation with our strange host. We saw he was a man of culture and good breeding, but very reticent about relating anything of his past life at first. But after supper, which consisted of venison steak, trout, cornbread, and coffee made of parched corn, and which seemed to me the best meal I ever tasted, he became more communicative and finally told us the romantic and sad history of his life. Part Two, The Old Hermit's Story I was born, brought up, and educated in the city of New York, began the old man. There were the scenes of many happy days for me in my boyhood, of some sad ones as I advanced in age. Imagine a lad happy, full of life and gaiety, having no apprehensive thought other than of happiness for the future, living only in the present, having a cheery home, a kind father, a gentle and ever-loving mother, and everything that a young heart could wish for. Such was I at the age of ten years. I attended the best school in the city was quick to learn and a favorite with my teachers and schoolmates. Those were happy days for me. Oh, that we could realize the vast happiness of our youthful days before they are past. My father was a merchant downtown. Well can I remember, when but a wee boy of six summers, my father took me down to his store one afternoon, and there for one glorious half-day I sported in great glee among piles of dry goods, boxes of shoes, hats, etc. I related my adventures to mother that evening with great gusto, and when father came home he took me on his knee and said, My little Georgie will some day own the store and all the pretty things he saw when papa has gone. Little did I think that some day would come so soon but so it proved. Ten years after my father died, and I found myself at the age of sixteen heir to his vast fortune. My school days were over, and I went into the large store left by my father, 
and with the assistance of a manager carried on the business as i grew up accustomed as i was in my youth to being petted and having my own way i began to show signs of waywardness which greatly displeased my manager and brought new grief to my mother at the age of eighteen i was more fond of spending money than i was of earning it i had in fact given myself up to fast living if not actual dissipation i was fond of gay companions of wine the club and ballroom as i handled plenty of money i did not hesitate to avail myself of every luxury my heart desired of course i had many friends as i spent money lavishly and as i was rather comely in appearance i was a special object of adoration among the fair sex many is the time at this period of my life that my mother would weep over me and implore me to be a better son and i would for an hour be ashamed and repentant and promise her i would but alas my promise would soon be forgotten in another wild mad rush of gaiety at a rather questionable resort i first met lulu wilson she was i believe the prettiest creature that i ever saw but little did i then know of the deceit and wickedness that lay behind those twinkling blue eyes she fascinated me with them i fell madly in love with her and was delighted to see that she appeared fond of me i took her to balls to the theatre i was constantly by her side i adored her and in spite of the whisperings of my friends that she was a clever adventuress and against the wishes of my mother i married her when my mother heard of our engagement she was very sad and said to me dear george you can never be happy with that woman i have taken pains to find out her history and it is bad very bad i would listen to nothing and so the wedding came off i took my wife home to live with my mother and for a time confined myself more attentively to business and as everything went well i was really happy i was always ready to gratify my wife's every whim and by her advice made many investments to induce larger returns in my business not knowing that this would surely lead to my destruction a short time after i became of age my dear mother was taken violently ill and died before a physician could reach the house the doctors said heart failure but i am now confident that my wife administered poison or something which caused her death by the death of my mother i lost the only blood relation that i ever knew and found myself the sole possessor of a large amount of property i was by her death drawn more closely to my wife if such a thing was possible and was willing to abide by her advice and she took an active interest in my business she urged me to speculate and i speculated heavily things took a turn and i saw that my business and property were being fast involved in debt my wife urged me to deed everything over to her so i would be safe from creditors until the crisis was past and things took a turn for the better this i blindly consented to do a few days after the transfer i went home one afternoon to find the house closed and my wife gone i inquired of the neighbors and elicited the information that she had left the house about an hour before in company with a strange man i was astonished at this and as i stood there wondering two men came up took possession of the house and showed me papers to prove that they had bought it of my wife i rushed down the street to the police station and asked the chief what to do he told me i had better hunt up my wife and get an explanation of her conduct i went on the search for her 
and found that she had, in company with a tall, dark-looking man, boarded a northbound train, having bought tickets for Albany. I also bought a ticket for the same place, and taking the next train was soon speeding northward. I arrived in Albany that evening about nine o'clock, and anxiously inquired of the depot authorities there whether they had seen a couple answering to the description I gave. They had not, and intimated that if I was tracing anybody I had better secure the services of a professional detective. Tired and distracted in body and mind, I sought a hotel and tried vainly to get some rest. Early next morning I went to police headquarters and engaged the services of a detective, and he and I took up the search for my runaway wife. We found that she and her companion had stayed at a hotel in the city and had been driven to the depot early in the morning where they took a train for Saratoga. The detective and myself followed after. On reaching Saratoga, we found that the couple had alighted from a train there and were somewhere in that city. In conversing with the Saratoga chief of police, I made the discovery that my wife was a former resident of that place where she had a very bad record previous to her going to New York, and that her marrying me was probably a bold scheme of hers to get hold of my property. Acting upon this advice, I swore out a warrant for her arrest, and officers were sent scouring the city in search of her. I went to a hotel, leaving word that when she was found I was to be notified, so I could appear and prefer charges against her. In the afternoon a message came to me that my wife had evaded the officers, and still in company with her male companion, had taken a train going north, evidently bound for Canada. I determined that I would follow her even to the end of the earth, and when I found her would shoot her down in her tracks. With this rash impulse, I stopped at a store, bought a revolver, and rushed down to the depot. A train was just about to go. I asked the agent what train it was, and he said, Northbound. I hurriedly jumped aboard without buying a ticket, and off we went. The conductor came around calling for tickets. I told him I had none, and inquired the fare in cash to Montreal to which place I presumed my wife had gone. "'To Montreal!' he exclaimed. "'You are on the wrong road. You should have taken a train on the Champlain Division. This goes up into the Adirondack Mountains. You will have to get off at the next station and wait for a train back to Saratoga.' About ten miles farther on, the train came to a halt at a small station, and I alighted and strolled about the place, awaiting a return train to Saratoga. The depot agent came out of his office after a short time, glancing sharply at me as he went past and down the walk which led to the little village nearby. He soon returned in company with a large man who came up to me and asked me if my name was George so-and-so. I replied that it was, wondering who the man was and what he wanted. Then, he said, laying his hand on my shoulder, I arrest you on a telegram just received from New York, where you are wanted on a charge of fraudulently transferring or disposing of your property with intent to beat your creditors and leave the country. Come with me. Not expecting anything of this kind, I was for a moment dazed by this development and made no reply, but mechanically followed the officer as he went back toward the village. But quickly there came to my senses a realization of the bad fix I was in. Disgrace and imprisonment were before me and sure to be my lot 
and all because I loved and gratified the requests of one I trusted implicitly, but who had turned out to be falser than Satan himself. A great fear came over me, and a longing to be free, to flee far away, I knew not, nor cared not, where, only somewhere to get away from these tormenting thoughts that possessed my mind. I could not endure the thought of being a prisoner in the hands of the law for a crime of which I considered myself innocent. Acting on the impulses of the moment, I quickly put my hand in my pocket, drew out my revolver, and shot at the constable before he had time to prevent me. He threw up his hands, and with a cry of pain fell over backward. Then with a bound I left him and ran like a wild deer into the forest nearby. I will not weary you with all the details of the terrible days and nights which followed. Pursued, broken-hearted, and forlorn, I wandered. Going for days without food except wild berries, and such game as I could shoot with my small revolver, exposing myself to great dangers from wild beasts, etc., until one day I accidentally stumbled upon this spot, found this cabin, these utensils, and this gun, just as you see them. Who they belong to, I know not. No person has come to claim them, nor has mortal foot except my own, trod this ground for the many years I have lived here until you came. But here I have lived all alone, musing on the past, an outcast from the society of man, a fugitive from justice, I, perhaps a murderer, and all on account of the woman I once loved. God knows how well." But I am here, and here I must stay until death shall some day find me, and my spirit shall go free to experience in its future dwelling place what. As for you, I will conduct you out tomorrow, but in a manner that will completely blind you as to the route, and I have no fears that you or any other persons will ever find the way to this place. Part Three. Farewell, dear hermit. It was near the hour of midnight when the old man finished his strange tale, and at its conclusion he arose and went to the farther corner of the cabin, where he stretched himself out on a pile of furs, which were thrown on the floor, and was soon sleeping soundly, his hand resting on his gun which lay at his side. But Harry and myself were too excited with the events of the day to think of sleep, so we sat and pondered on what our aged host had told us. Long before dawn he was astir and prepared some breakfast. After partaking of it, the hermit took up his gun and started out, beckoning us to follow. It was so dark that we could scarcely discern our hands before our faces but our guide did not seem to mind this, but led the way off through the forest, and we, by the aid of his voice, managed to follow him. We went uphill and downhill, and downhill and uphill, until we thought we had traveled far enough to go halfway to Europe, as Harry expressed it, when, just as day was breaking, we found ourselves out in the clearing about five miles from the settlement. Here the old man left us, and without waiting to receive our thanks, beat a hasty retreat in the direction whence we came. We resumed our journey, and were soon at home relating our adventures to our friends, who would not believe a word we told them, but said, "'The next time you two go hunting, you had better take a smaller-sized bottle.' and then perhaps you will not have to draw on your imagination for an excuse for staying out all night. The incidents of which I write occurred some years ago. Since then, myself, as well as many others, 
have made repeated attempts to again discover the lost lake and old hermit, but without avail, and the whole matter is swallowed up in deep mystery, seemingly never to be revealed. End of section one. Section two of Stories from the Adirondacks by Albert A. Young. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section two. Adventures of Camp Life. There were five of us in the party, and we were camped on the shores of a beautiful pond away back among the Adirondack Mountains and were enjoying a week's fishing in the vicinity. There were Richard Longworth and Thomas Statton, two young dry goods merchants from New York, who were on their first visit to the mountains, old Saul Hallway and Dave Bryan, two Adirondack guides, and the fifth person was the humble writer of this book. Longworth and Statton were stopping at a popular summer resort, and I, being in the vicinity a considerable portion of my time, became acquainted with them in some way. Being desirous of spending some part of their vacation in fishing, they asked me one day what the prospects were for getting some trout. I proposed to them that we procure a guide, camp out, and do some night fishing in one of the ponds in the vicinity. After talking the matter over, we decided that we would ask both old Saul and Brian to accompany us. We hired a tent and camping utensils, also two boats, and a team to convey us and our duffel to a pond where our guide said we were apt to have good success. We staked our camp there, and were soon doing a flourishing business, catching fish, fighting mosquitoes, and having more fun than you could shake a stick at, as old Saul expressed it. This worthy personage was a whole circus in himself, and his greatest pride was in living up to his reputation, that of being the biggest liar in the Adirondacks. As he was a good talker, and an adept at bringing out many strong points, I delighted in listening to his stories of wonderful adventures, and hair-breadth escapes, which he would relate to us of an evening as we sat in our tent, or in a boat out on the pond engaged in fishing. Of course, I knew that they were the biggest kind of yarns, but the unsophisticated city youths believed that they were the solemn truth, as Brian, who was about Saul's equal in yarning, was in the habit of corroborating everything that Saul said and in their opinion Saul was a greater man than General Grant ever was. "'Tell you what,' old Saul said, aside to Dave Bryan and myself, "'you can make them air city chaps believe that the moon's made of green cheese, but they'll get initiated one of these days.' And many degrees were conferred on them by the old guide. For instance, he would tell them some blood-curdling story of panthers, and then, pretending to have heard one scream, he and Dave would rush out of the tent to listen, leaving the New Yorkers trembling with fear inside and myself convulsed with laughter. It was the third night of our stay in camp, and we were out on the pond engaged in fishing. Old Saul and the two Yorkers were in one boat, and Dave Bryan and myself occupied the other. But we were not far apart, but lay anchored side by side. It was the middle of June. The sky was cloudy and the night of Stygian darkness. Away off in the southwest we could hear the low rumbling of thunder, and occasionally flashes of lightning would dart across the sky. Off across the pond, an owl was breaking the stillness by his continued and lonesome to who to who and the frogs croaked incessantly along the shores 
it was just such a scene as old Saul delighted in, and he took the occasion to tell one of his wild stories. Dave, said he, after we had fished in silence for some minutes, Dave, do you believe in ghosts? Well, drawled Dave, can't say that I do, though I've seen some strange things in my lifetime. So have I, so have I, said Saul, and this night makes me think of a strange experience I had once in these air parts. Did I ever tell you about it, Dave? Guess not. Well, twas about ten year ago, and when I first commenced guiding in these woods. There used to be an old lumber camp across the pond yonder, and near the edge of a big swamp. Well, there used to be a story that, on a time, when a man by the name of whatever, well, it's queer I can't think of his name, but never mind, had a job there, and one day he got mad at his wife, for something or other, and he up and killed her, so they say, and buried her body in the swamp. Of course, I never believed the story. Well, one day I was guiding a party in the woods, and, as I said afore, being new at the biz, and not acquainted with the country, I lost my way, and we wandered around till it was nearly night, when we happened to run across the old lumber camp. I proposed to my companions that we roost there for the night, and they gladly consented being bout tuckered out by their long tramp. I gathered some pine bows and made a kind of bed in a corner of the old shanty, and my companions throwed themselves down on it and were soon snoring. But somehow or other I was not sleepy, and after laying there a while I got up and went outdoors and sat down on a log in front of the shanty. It was just about this time of the year, and a night a good deal like this. It was thundering away in the west, and I knew it was going to rain, and I wondered if the old shanty would leak and we would get wet. Then as my thoughts turned to the shanty, I wondered whose shanty it was, and somehow or other my mind turned to the story of the shanty man who murdered his wife and buried her in a swamp, and I begun to speculate as to what foundation the story had on facts. As I sat there musing away, an owl, maybe the same darn critter we can hear tonight, only younger, was hooting away back in the woods, and the night was lonely enough, I can tell you. The raindrops begun to patter on the roof of the shanty, and I got up and started to go inside, when I was startled to hear, a little ways off to the right, a low moan, as if some human being in distress. I stopped short and held my breath while I listened for a repetition of the noise. But after waiting for quite a spell without hearing anything but that old owl, I started on again. Moan, moan, there was no mistaking at this time, for I heard it as plain as day. But I didn't get scared, oh no. I reached in my pocket, kind of unconcerned like, took out a plug of tobacco and took a chaw. Then I reached for my gun, which stood again the side of the shanty, and started in the direction from whence came the noise. I conjectured that the noise was made by some animal what was prowling round our camp, and meant to settle his hash in a hurry. I stumbled through the brush which grew round the shanty, the groans all the while growing louder and louder, and after going a few rods, as I live, I saw, looming up just before me, a uh, what this wonderful thing was that old Saul saw, looming up before him, we never found out, for just at this point his narrative was interrupted by a series of the most ear-piercing, terrifying screams 
that mortal man ever listened to ringing out in the night air at the first cry i could see by the light of our lantern the faces of old saul and dave turn pale and their hair actually rise up the two city youths sank down in a heap in the bottom of the boat and i myself was as frightened as the rest to add to the consternation a gust of wind sent ahead by the approaching shower blew out our light and left us in total darkness the lightning flashed the thunder rolled and down came the storm and smote amain the vessel in its strength while above all arose those heart-rendering cries and a loud splashing was heard down the pond as if some mighty animal had jumped into the water and was swimming rapidly toward us part two i think i was the first to come to my senses and to a realization of our apparent danger and calling to old Saul to pull up the anchor of his boat and follow me, I took up the oars of my own boat and pulled rapidly up the pond in the direction of our camp. I wanted to get ashore and obtain a gun, as we had none in the boats. Then if the animal, whatever it was, should follow and attack us, we would have something to defend ourselves with. It was too dark to see what the occupants of the other boat were doing, but I could hear the dip of Saul's oars and him puffing and blowing, as if he were rowing for all his might. After a while he seemed to have stopped. I called out to him to come on, but received no response. All was as still as the grave, as the cries of the animal had also suddenly ceased. I asked Dave if we had not better go back and ascertain if Saul's party had been capsized or anything had happened to them. But he said, No, for God's sake. Let's tend to our own bacon and let them go to thunder. Thinking myself that self-preservation was the first law of nature, I pulled away and in the course of five minutes reached the shore. The rain by this time was pouring down in torrents, and we were wet to the skin. As we were pulling our boat out of the water, we thought we heard, out in the pond, a cry as from somebody in distress. But after listening closely and hearing no more, we concluded that we must have been mistaken. We supposed we had landed near our camp and went hunting around in search of it, but it did not take us long to discover that we had gone amiss and were we knew not where we searched and searched as well as we could in the darkness but found no familiar spot or object consulting as to what it was best for us to do we agreed that we could do nothing until it was daylight and finding a huge rock we climbed to the top and perched there impatiently awaited the coming of the dawn speculating as to the possible fate of our friends at last after seemingly weeks of waiting the morning dawned the beautiful sun came up dried our clothes and showed us where we were from our perch on the rock we could see that we had not landed anywhere near our camp but were fully a mile from it Climbing down from our night's resting place, we went down to our boat and were soon at home in our tent. We waited there until noon in hopes that Saul and his party would put in their appearance, but as they did not, we decided to go out to the settlement and organize a searching party to go out after them. Accordingly, we started and had almost reached the clearing when we were rejoiced to meet a party of men and at their head old saul who were coming in to hunt us up old saul ran forward embraced and hugged us while the tears streamed down his cheeks by golly boys he said i thought you were goners never so tickled in my life to think we're all safe 
it seems that the experience of saul and the two with him was similar to that of dave and myself only instead of going to the camp in the morning they made a bee-line for town where the two new york men were glad to take to their beds while saul got several of the natives together to go in search of us we returned to the town tired but glad that we were alive and that evening we planned that on the next day we would all turn out and go in search of the panthers we had heard at the pond for panther we supposed it to be part three out from that peaceful settlement there rose a noisy happy company of us that pleasant summer morn nearly all of the natives who could shoot a gun and some who could not volunteered their services and even the small boys were anxious to join in the hunt and as we rode away the children stood watching us out of the town and we went forth with shining sword and poised lance to slay that animal if we get a chance as old saul expressed it it was a pleasure to me to witness the gay spirits of my companions who sang and shouted until the mountains rang with the echo i was not long however in discovering that their joyfulness was not wholly caused by the brightness of the morn or anticipations of the day's chase for we had not gotten fairly out of sight of the houses of the little village when old saul reached in under the wagon seat and drew out a big jug which he raised in his hands high above his head and in a loud stage voice exclaimed here is some shining sparkling juice for which there's many and many a use twill break up a cold and cure a chill so come up all you duffers come up drink your fill whoa there driver let's oil up a little and oil up they did in first-class shape and on we went again the party numbered eight men besides myself all armed while several dogs of various breeds ran barking and snarling behind us it was our intention to ride as far as the rough road would admit for which purpose we had charted an old team of horses and a rickety wagon then we were to proceed on foot into the woods which surrounded the pond the scene of our recent adventure there we were going to separate and each man was to take up a station on the watch one of the men was to take the dogs and scout around the pond in hopes of having the canine scent the animal and drive it around where some of us could get a shot at it everything went according to arrangement after going as far as we thought advisable with the team we unharnessed the horses and tied them to the wheels of the wagon leaving a bundle of hay for them to eat we then proceeded a distance on foot and after a short consultation we separated before we did so the contents of the jug were emptied into pint bottles and every man except myself took one old saul strongly urged me to do so saying twon't hurt you and you'll need it to brace you up when you see that air panther comin toward you but thinking if such a result as having that panther coming toward me was likely i would be better prepared to face it with my sober senses and a clear brain i declined with thanks as we went crashing off through the brush to take up our positions we could hear the voice of old saul calling after us to look careful now boys and don't let the pesky critter scape you etc until we were far apart that the reader may better understand our positions a little explanation is necessary we were in the woods which surrounded the pond on the opposite side from where the camp we had occupied stood we were distant about twenty rods from the water and were to be arranged at about an equal distance from each other in a semicircle around the pond 
as many of the men believed that the animal was hiding in the immediate vicinity. Arranged as indicated, we took up our stand, I being the last one in the semicircle near the head of the pond. It was past the noon hour when we got settled each in our place. After waiting about a half hour, I heard the dogs set up a furious barking in the direction that the man had gone to start them, and concluded that they had struck the track of the animal and was on the alert to shoot it if it came my way. I soon perceived, however, that the dogs were heading off in an opposite direction and going farther and farther away. Very soon they were out of hearing. Another hour passed away, and still no more was heard of the dogs or animals of which they were supposed to be in pursuit. I began to get a little lonesome and impatient for something to transpire. After waiting a few minutes longer, I thought I would go over to where my nearest neighbor was on the watch and have a little conversation with him to pass away the time. I accordingly walked off to the left about thirty rods to the place where I supposed him to be stationed, but he was not there, and I walked on still farther. Still nobody could I see. I shouted out several times, but received no answer except the echo of my own voice. Thinking that the man had gone down nearer the pond, I went in that direction. Hearing voices ahead of me, I hastened along, and soon came in sight of an old lumber shanty. The voices came from inside of this, and going forward, I pushed aside the rude door and entered. There inside were Old Saul, Dave Bryan, and the other six men of the party, all engaged in having a jolly time, to say the least. Their bottles now nearly empty, they were brandishing in the air while they performed a wild can-can around the room. They grabbed hold of me when I entered and urged me to drink and join in their carousals, but I refused and began to beseech of them to go home as night was coming on. They would listen to nothing, but again broke into a wild whirl of gaiety. Realizing the uselessness of pleading with them, and not wishing myself to spend the night in an old shanty, I left them in disgust and started for the settlement. As I went walking rapidly away from the shanty, I could hear the mellow voice of old Saul singing, "'Oh, it's up the river and down the creek, and it won't be day for an hour yet.' I would rather hunt than to plow or sow, and I don't care whether I go home or no." I hastened on, and just as night was falling, I reached the little village whence we had started in the morning. That was the last I ever saw of old Saul, or any of the men, as I was called from the place early the following morning and never knew at what time old Saul's party got out of the woods, or what became of the animal of which he went in search. I read in the Adirondack News of the following week this interesting piece of news, which sounded as if it had its origin with old Saul. A strange animal, whose size was nearly that of a Newfoundland dog, and whose cries were similar to those of a panther, only louder and more varied, was seen a few nights ago in the vicinity of Fisher's Pond by a guide named Hallway and a party with him. A party was organized next day to hunt for the animal. It was seen by Hallway, who shot several times at it, when it retreated into the woods crying furiously. Hallway deserves much credit for his bravery in the matter. He says he will yet have the animal's pelt. End of section two.
Section three of Stories from the Adirondacks by Albert A. Young. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section three. The Club of Mysterious Characters. Part one. Discovery of the Club and its Strange Haunts. On a quiet street in the village of Saranac, in the Adirondacks, there stands an elegant and imposing-looking mansion. The passer-by would regard this large and costly structure, with its many wings, porticos, and beautiful ornamentations, as the residence of a man of fortune. But if you will stop for a moment and notice, there is an air of quietness about the place that cannot fail to impress you that the owner is of a very retiring nature as no stir of any kind is to be observed, and as you pass on you involuntarily wonder what kind of a man the master of this mansion is, and if you ever heard of him. The truth is there is no master, and the building is unoccupied except for the hours from ten to twelve Monday and Friday nights of each week. Then within those walls which look so majestic and grand, there assemble a company of men which for originality and oddity one would scarcely meet in a year's travel they style themselves the club of mysterious characters or league of social woodsmen their meetings and doings are as secret as are those of a band of counterfeiters and this is how i came to find them out one day I received through the post office of my native town a letter addressed to me in a scrawling and nearly indecipherable hand, and running as follows. Dear Sir, I have long known and watched you and have formed a deep regard for you. Therefore I ask you to go to the large mansion on B Street in Saranac next Monday night at 10.30 o'clock go to the last door on the left rap so many times and say blank when you will be admitted and learn of something greatly to your advantage yours blank the spaces which i have left blank were not so in the letter but as i am now under a solemn oath not to reveal any secrets i omit the words here well you may imagine my surprise at receiving this strange epistle what it all meant i had not the slightest idea and i really felt a little alarmed as i had read of so many cases where persons were decoyed away and so forth that i did not know but what there was a plot being laid to endanger my safety my first thought was to consult at once the proper authorities place the letter in their hands and ask them to ferret out the mystery but after some consideration of the matter curiosity overcame fear and i resolved to follow the directions of the letter and ascertain who the writer was and what he meant and wanted even if i was murdered for so doing so monday night found me in the village of saranac in a tremor of excitement to be sure but withal feeling quite secure for two heavily loaded revolvers were in easy reach in my pockets and i was anxiously awaiting the hour of ten thirty to come i went over the street on which the house which had been described to me stood and passed near by it i peered sharply around to see if i could detect the presence of any person in the neighborhood but nobody was in sight neither could i see any light issuing from the inside of the house but instead all was dark and still resolving however to fulfill the mission on which i was bent but fearing if i loitered around near the house and side of the street that i might be taken for a burglar or suspicious character by some passer-by i shrank back into a sort of alleyway near by and waited as patiently as I could for the hour of ten-thirty to arrive. How many times I looked at my watch in the brief time that I spent there, I will not attempt to tell. Every minute seemed an hour to me. 
my courage failed every minute, and I had about concluded to get out of there and make a break for home, when again, looking at my watch, I saw that the hands marked the hour of ten-thirty on the dial, and I knew that the time for me to solve the mystery of my strange letter had come, and with it returned some of my courage. "'Perhaps it means a thousand dollars in my pocket,' I thought, "'and perhaps it means death. But here goes.' And I stepped out and walked briskly along by the side of the house toward the last door on the left. I had located it as I had passed in the daytime and knew exactly where to go. I reached the door and, rapping on it, uttered the password which had been named in the letter. In an instant it was opened, and a stream of light met my gaze. I stepped inside, the heavy door closed behind me, and I looked around to see who had admitted me and what kind of a place I had stumbled into. I found myself in a long hall, dimly lighted by one small lamp which hung suspended from the ceiling, and by my side stood a man with whom I was as well acquainted as with my own brother. The fears that I had entertained vanished on the instant at sight of him, but astonishment filled their place. I grabbed him eagerly by the arm and inquired, "'What means this? What are you doing? And why did you call me here?' For answer he gave a low laugh. "'Come with me,' said he, "'and I will conduct you to the General Assembly Room of the Club of Mysterious Characters. All the members are present, and the exercises of the evening will soon commence. The subject tonight is mysteries, and but come along and you will know all and taking me by the arm he led me forward down the long hall and ushered me into a large room beyond here a remarkable scene met my gaze never was a room more grandly furnished rich carpets of the most elegant pattern covered the floor beautiful oriental rugs lay here and there Heavy lace curtains covered the windows, and fine paintings adorned the walls. But all this, though complete in detail and manner of arrangement, did not attract my attention half as much as did the company I found assembled there. Around a large table, under the brilliant light of a mammoth chandelier, a dozen men were seated, reading or smoking. Men, I say, and so they were but at first sight one would have taken them for wild animals for each wore a mask which exactly resembled the head of some beast of the forest some were wolves some bears and others something else all were masked except my guide and yet i knew they were men but what men and where from i did not know as we entered the room, none of them looked up or seemed to notice our arrival in any way. None of them spoke for some time. Presently one who sat near the head of the table, and who wore the mask of a panther, arose from his seat and touched a little bell which stood on the table near him. "'Brethren of the League,' he began, "'it is now time to open the services of the evening.' and as our guest has arrived, I see no reason for further delay. The secretary will please call the roll. Each person present answered when a list of names were called off, but none of the names were familiar to me, and I felt sure they were all assumed ones. Even my guide responded to the call of a name I had never heard before. When this formality was completed, the man who had spoken before again arose and said, turning to and addressing me, "'My dear friend, I bid you welcome. Your invitation here was for a purpose. What that purpose is you will learn later. For the present let it pass. The gentleman so strangely attired whom you see gathered here 
comprise the club of mysterious characters of the adirondacks i will not tell you in what manner our society was formed or how we came to be located here suffice it to say that we are here and here to stay and we are powerful and wise in our way although you may not think it honorable in us we know the private life of every public personage my friend i could tell you secrets about persons whom you know that would astonish i alarm you and of incidents in your own life which you little think any person but yourself know of but i have no desire to do so now the reason you were invited here is that you might be given an insight into our doings and if afterwards you wish to become as one of us you will be given the privilege as i said before we know much but yet there are many things that are mysteries to us and of these some of the members will speak to-night mysteries of the forests which we wish were made plain and we will endeavor to make them so mr blank your turn is first and the man who wore the mask of a bear arose and commenced speaking part two mystery of sheldon's woods the subject upon which i wish to dwell to-night said the man with the mask of a bear is the mystery of sheldon's woods the more i ponder on it the more unsolvable does it seem what i am to relate happened many years ago in my native town at that time i was residing in the country alternately farming and hunting for a living and i had two boys growing up frank was fourteen and will sixteen they were both good boys and dutiful to their parents and i could depend on them every time they were like their father fond of hunting and i had supplied them with guns and when there was not much work to be done i would permit them to scour the nearby forests in search of game but i always cautioned them not to go too far from home one day in early autumn when the partridges were abundant and fat they took their guns and started forth noon came the time for their return but they came not at four o'clock they being yet absent i began to feel some anxiety concerning them and started to go out in search of them i had not gone far when i saw them coming toward me they were running wildly and were minus their guns and hats they came up to me panting heavily the perspiration pouring off their faces sank down on the grass at my feet and it was some minutes before they could speak although i eagerly questioned them to ascertain what was the matter when they had recovered their breath sufficiently to talk they told me a most strange story i will repeat it as nearly as possible in their own words the game was not very plenty over there in our woods where we first went and so we kept going farther away until we found ourselves away over in sheldon's woods we remarked that we were getting a long way from home and had better be going back feeling tired we sat down on a small knoll to rest a little while before starting and began to look about us what was our surprise at seeing lying on the ground a short distance from us the dead body of a woman we jumped up in alarm and were about to run from the spot but calmed our fears the best we could and decided to investigate the matter a little we went up close to the body and stooped down to examine it it was a young woman of beautiful form and features who looked as if she had been dead several days as we stood regarding her lost in astonishment and horror we heard a voice an awful voice behind us and as we turned we saw the form of a person that was hideous in the extreme it was an old man with long gray whiskers and glittering black eyes 
and in his hand he had a long dirk knife, which he waved wildly in the air as he advanced toward us. "'You contemptible young imps!' he shouted. "'Do you leave this place or die?' And then he swore a horrible oath, but we waited to hear no more. Off through the woods we started at the top of our speed, forgetting in our haste to take up our guns, and behind us came that old man screaming at the top of his voice. How we got out of the woods we do not know, but we are here and we are very glad of it. The following day a searching party was formed, and the woods for miles around were thoroughly explored but no trace could be found of any dead body, of the old man, or of even the guns of Frank and Will. Frank's hat was found hanging on a bush in the woods, and, strange to say, at a little distance from it, a little red and blue hood. Aside from these things, we gained nothing and returned home none the wiser. But for all that, I do not believe that the boys lied about what they saw. The man in the mask of a bear, having concluded his remarks, sat down. Nobody spoke, and nobody seemed surprised at his strange story. The man with the mask of a panther quietly took a cigar from his pocket, lighted it with a match, and commenced smoking, his hair tipped back, and his feet elevated, with his eyes on the ceiling as if lost in deep thought. After some moments he arose from his seat, threw his cigar into a receiver, and slowly commenced speaking. "'As I am number two, I suppose it is now my turn to relate a mystery. The tale of my brother, just concluded, brings to my mind one which I will tell to you to-night.' I first wish to say that the world is full of mysteries. We are kept in a perpetual wonder. The mysteries of creation, the mysteries of nature, the mystery of life and death, and of the life beyond the grave. God works in a mysterious way his wonders to perform. We should therefore have the greatest reverence for mysterious things. What is invisible to us is visible to some, and always plain to him who rules both the day and the night. Part Three, Mystery of the Old Woman Thirty years ago, he continued, the house in which I resided stood on the now abandoned Cedar Point Road. That road, now traveled only by hunters and trappers, was then the main route between Lake Champlain and the Adirondack Lumber and Iron region, and was much traveled by teams drawing supplies to the lumbermen and miners. One day, in the fall of the year, a strange old woman came walking along the road and stopped at my house. I was not at home, but my wife received her and invited her in. The strange woman asked my wife how far it was to Green Bay. "'I know of no such place,' replied my wife. "'You are evidently on the wrong road.' "'No,' she said. "'Green Bay is where he is, and I am going to him. He forsook me, but I will go to him and on my bended knees beg him to take me back, for I love him, love him, love him.' My wife saw that the woman was not in her right mind, and tried to persuade her to stay until my return, that she might consult with me concerning her. But the strange creature would not stop, but departed after a short time, in spite of the earnest protests of my wife. Ours was the last house between the settlement near Lake Champlain and the mining and lumbering region toward the west. Twenty miles of road, the most of the way running through a dense wilderness, lie between us and the lumber region. It was quite late in the afternoon when the woman left our house, and it was evident that night would overtake her in the midst of the woods, 
unless some chance teamster should pick her up, which was very doubtful, as all the teams passed in the morning. My wife was greatly excited, as she thought of the possible fate of the old woman, should night overtake her in the wilderness, bears and other wild animals being plenty. She resolved to send me after her, as soon as I returned home to bring her back. But I did not return until it was night, and as I had no horse, I knew that the chances for overtaking her by going on foot would be small. Therefore, I did not go. We heard no more of the strange woman for some time. One day, a teamster coming out from the lumber camps picked up a hat by the roadside and brought it out to the settlement, where it was recognized by my wife as the one worn by the woman at the time she stopped at our house. The next day her dead body was found lying on the ground a short distance from the road. It was brought out, and an inquest was held. The jury brought in the verdict that the woman, to them unknown, came to her death by exposure. She was given a decent burial in the cemetery of my town. Every effort was made to discover her identity, but all to no avail. Authorities were consulted, advertisements written, but no information could we get as to where she came from or who she was, and it remains a mystery still. The clock on the mantelpiece struck the hour of twelve as the man with the panther mask ceased his story. Several of the men were yawning and seemed to take no interest in his remarks. Part Four joining the club he turned to me and said my friend take this little book and read our objects conditions and requirements after so doing should you wish to join us we will initiate you and so close this evening's meeting our next meeting will be on friday night next commencing at the usual hour and i wish to say to the members that the password is number 17 in the Book of Secrets, and the exercises of that evening will be stories which unravel mysteries. Perhaps they will throw some light on the things we have heard tonight. If our terms are satisfactory and are complied with, we shall expect you to be present and take a part. I carefully read the rules and regulations of the club in the little book which he handed me. I saw that the requirements were very exacting, and the penalty for not fulfilling them, death. But I was fascinated with the whole thing, intensely interested in the strange stories I had heard, and I wished to hear more. So I took the pen tended me by the secretary and firmly wrote my name as one who wished to become a member. Then a scene of the wildest confusion followed. All of the members jumped from their seats and made a rush for me. They seized me, bound me hand and foot, and blindfolded me. Then I felt myself being carried on, on, on. Somebody whispered in my ear, the password is mysterious. Then I received a severe rap on my head, and I became unconscious. Part V. Mysterious Disappearance of the Club When I came to my senses, I found myself lying by the roadside, many miles from the mysterious club room in which I had lately been, and alone and so I became a member of the Club of Mysterious Characters, or did I not? On the night appointed for the next meeting, I went to the mansion as before, rapped on the last door on the left, and expected to be admitted, but the door was not opened, and I tapped again, this time louder. Still no answer came to my summons. Then I applied my ear to the door, and eagerly listened to catch, if I could, any sound from within. But all was still. 
I walked all around the building to see if I could detect a light or the presence of any person, but failed to do so. At last, utterly discouraged, I came away. The next day I sought the man who had first admitted me to the presence of the club and demanded an explanation, but the only thing he would say in regard to the matter was to ask me if I had not been dreaming. And I am still lost in wonder at the strange turn of affairs. Have I made some mistake? Have I violated any rule? Or what is the reason I was not admitted to that mysterious club's house on the evening of the last visit to the same are things which are as mysterious to me as anything I saw or heard on the night when I first went there. End of section 3section four of stories from the adirondacks by albert a young this librivox recording is in the public domain section four the hero of toppin's camp newcomb a town in the adirondacks is undoubtedly the most important lumber region in the north at certain seasons of the year the little hamlet of that name which nestles close to the foot of Mount Marcy, reminds one of nothing so much as the description of a mining town in the far west. Men of all nationalities and peculiarities convene there through the fall and winter months. The many saloons of the place are well patronized, and the shouts of the bacchanalian lumbermen and hangers-on, mingled with gay, rollicking songs, can be heard in all directions. Back in the spruce forests which surround Newcomb on all sides are the lumber camps. They are frequented as a rule by a hardy class of men, but sometimes a tenderfoot, who has had pictured to him the bright side of a lumberman's life, finds his way in there and goes to work with a gang, only to find himself made a butt of ridicule and contempt until life becomes such a burden to him that he is forced to resign his position and seek employment with a more congenial company. The woodsmen hoot him out of sight and then turn to their work, laughing and jesting as if it was the occasion of some good joke, as indeed it is to them. From a pleasant home in a village not one hundred miles from New York City, there started one pleasant day in September, not many years ago, a fine-featured, educated young man bound for the lumber woods of Newcomb. He intended to be absent from his home for some months, and after a tearful parting with his widowed mother and fair young sweetheart, and receiving their caution to be careful and not get hurt, and be sure and write to us often, he boarded a train and was carried on toward the north. He was now the sole support of his mother. His father, once a prosperous businessman, had met with a reverse of fortune, which caused his downfall in business and in health, and he died leaving his family with very limited means. After trying vainly to obtain a paying situation near home, our hero had heard of the big wages paid in the Northwoods lumber camps and decided to cast his lot there. He was strong, brave, and not afraid to work, and had every confidence he could do good service in the lumbering business. Reaching Newcomb the following day, he instituted inquiries as to the prospect of securing employment and was told that a man by the name of Toppins had recently started a large job, was in need of more men, and was offering extra inducements to secure them. Therefore, in Toppins' camp, Frank, as we will call our hero, went. It was nearly night when he reached the camp. The men were just coming in from their work, and greeted Frank as he came in sight with cries of, Hello, Johnny, where are you going to play tonight? etc., etc. He minded not their rudeness, but hunted up the boss and presented himself for employment. He engaged himself as a chopper, 
and the next day was set to work under a big Frenchman by the name of Joe, who was the boss chopper. The gang had considerable fun at our hero's expense, but he took it good-naturedly and went to work with a determination to succeed in doing his share, and with hopes of, by so doing, of winning the respect of the rough woodsmen who recognize only two qualities in a fellow man, those of physical strength and bravery. Before the first day's work was done, he heard one of the men remark to another that, "'That duffer is some pumpkins after all, I guess,' meaning to convey the idea that Frank was regarded by him as being strong and able, and after that all of the men showed more respect to him. His day's work was finished. His employer, as is the custom each evening, asked him how many logs he had cut, and Frank gave the number as eighty. When the count was given in, Frank noticed a scowl on the face of the boss chopper and attributed it to disgust because he had not cut more. But when shortly after the B.C. gave his count as sixty-eight, he thought that that could not be the reason. The truth was, the Frenchman was angry because Frank had beaten him by twelve logs in his first day's work. The gang then proceeded to guy the boss chopper because he had been beaten by a tenderfoot, whereupon he became very angry and swore to utterly demolish the tenderfoot on the morrow. Frank was as strongly determined that he should do no such thing, and the next day the contest began. The Frenchman, stripped of all superfluous clothing, fell to work with all his strength. Frank made every blow count, and the gang encouraged them on with cries such as, "'Get thar, Canada!' and "'Go her, Johnny, or you'll lose your job!' Slam! Bang! went the axes. Right merrily flew the chips. It was a contest between giant strength on one side and cool pluck on the other. But pluck won. Frank, a hundred ten. Joe, a hundred two. Such was the count given in that evening. The boss chopper's face was a study. He grew red and pale by turns. He paced up and down the men's room several times, and finally went to bed without saying a word. The men knew that a big time was on, and eagerly awaited developments. Early next morning Joe came down from the sleeping apartment above in a tumult of wrath. Frank was engaged in putting on his shoes in a corner of the men's room. The Frenchman immediately went up to him and, shaking his fist under his nose, angrily exclaimed, "'You damned sucker! Maybe you beat me in chop, but me lick a dozen like you, and me gonna do it!' So saying, he hit Frank a stinging blow on the cheek. In an instant our hero's blood was up, and he jumped to his feet, resolved to do or die. Quick as a flash, he struck back at his burly antagonist a blow straight from the shoulder. It took him on the chin, and down went his form to the floor. But he quickly jumped up and made for Frank, roaring like a mad bull. Frank's school training now came into use. When the Frenchman came for him, he ducked, jumped to one side, and before his assailant could realize it, he was lying on the floor from the effects of a blow on his head. He slowly pulled himself together, got up on his feet, shook his fist at Frank, went out the door and disappeared down the road, going out from the camp. Then cheer after cheer from the gang nearly raised the roof from the shanty. Every one of the men rushed to Frank, shook his hand, and warmly applauded him for his bravery telling him that in future they were willing to do anything for him. The Frenchman was no favorite of the men anyway, and now that he was vanquished, and that too by a tenderfoot, their admiration and joy knew no bounds, 
and they danced around the rough floor, sang and laughed, and to end off with, took Frank on their shoulders and carried him to the woods, where they went to work again. Time passed on. Joe was not heard from after. As his going away left the position of Boss Chopper vacant, the place was offered to Frank at advanced wages. He accepted it, and during the six months that he stayed in the woods, he filled it with credit to himself and satisfaction to his employer. He was loved and respected by all the men, and at Christmas time, in consideration of many little favors shown them by Frank, such as writing letters, etc., many of the men being unable to read or write, they raised a nice little purse of money and presented it to him, and he sent it home to his mother down the Hudson. And so the winter passed away, without any new thing to break the monotony of camp life, and spring was near at hand. Frank was daily counting the minutes, looking eagerly forward to the time when he would again meet with his dear mother and sweetheart, with whom he intended to be joined in marriage in the spring, and they were as anxiously waiting his return. But now comes the sad part of this true tale, and I cannot refrain from dropping a tear as I write it. Alas, how cruel is fate! The winter is past, and spring has come. Toppin's job is ended. The men are collected together in the men's room, talking of events that are past and of the things to come. Some of them will depart for their homes on the morrow. Others will go on the drive that is, help float the logs down the Hudson River to the sawmills below. Frank decided to do the latter. It would make him later home, but he will be going toward it all the time, and be earning more money besides. And so the next day he starts. For five days everything goes well, and the drive is down the river several miles. A jam of logs is formed in the middle of the river, in a dangerous place, and the foreman calls for volunteers to go out and break it. Frank is one of the first to respond, and he, with three other brave men, advance, axes in hand to the center of the dam, a few rapid blows, and the logs are loosened and turn and toss in the swift current. Cries from the shore to, Look out! are heard. The men start back, leaping from log to log. Another moment, and all will be safely landed. Frank is behind. His three companions have gained the shore. In another moment he will be with them. He jumps for a log, but it floats from him. He strikes the water, and with an agonizing cry of, Tell mother on his lips, he is carried down in the swift current. Poor fellow! The next day his body is washed ashore many miles below, bruised and beaten by the rushing torrent, and is sent home. Oh, the agony, grief, and despair of that loving mother and expectant sweetheart! Let us draw a veil over that sad scene. At a point near where Frank was drowned is a huge rock known as Tragedy Rock. The boys up in the North Woods have composed a song in remembrance of the hero of Toppin's camp. I have often heard them sing it, but I can remember but one verse. He was a favorite of all, young, handsome, gay, and brave. But at the jam on Tragedy Rock, he met with a watery grave. End of section four. Section five of Stories from the Adirondacks by Albert A. Young. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section five. Bear Stories. Black bears are plenty in the Adirondacks, and perhaps the city reader will be interested in a few true stories concerning them. 
I can well remember the first bear I ever saw. It was when I was a lad of about sixteen years of age. My home was then in a sparsely settled region among the mountains, and one day in the fall of the year I had been out along a mountain road picking blackberries. I had filled my pail with the luscious fruit and was returning home, whistling merrily along the way. In going through a short piece of woods, imagine my surprise at seeing a big, black, shaggy animal jump into the road, not over a rod from me, and go running along ahead of me. Was I frightened? Well, I should say I was. I gave a yell like a Comanche Indian and took the back track. I ran one way and the bear the other. It would be hard to tell which was the most frightened. I do not know what became of my pail of berries. I did not have them when I stopped running. But I was young then. I have since seen many bears and killed quite a number. They have lost their terrors for me. I can recall catching a big bear alive in an old barn which stood in a back meadow near a forest. He was an old sheep thief, and had given the farmers round about any amount of trouble. One night a party of us determined to lay for the old fellow and give him a warm reception if he came around. We stationed ourselves behind the fence of the barnyard in which he had been plying his business of sheep catching and waited. Presently we heard something tearing around inside the barn and we thought we would take a peep inside and see what it was. "'Gee whiz,' said one of the men. "'It's a bear in the barn there. Now let's take him captive.' So we crept around quietly and closed the barn door, and behold, his bearship was a prisoner. How he did snarl and rage and try to get out, but he was there to stay. All next day every man, woman, and child for miles around crowded about that barn, peering in through the cracks to see our prize. Finally, after exhibiting him long enough, we cast lots to ascertain who should have the bounty and pelt, and the lucky man took a gun and, pointing in through a knot hole, shot Mr. Bruin dead. He was a huge fellow, and furnished bear steak enough to last the whole neighborhood for many days. The greatest number of bears I ever saw together was five. They were having a camp meeting, I guess. I ran upon them without making my presence known, and stood watching them for some minutes. They would go up close to each other and rub their noses together. Then they would back up sit down on their haunches and look at each other. Then they would get up and all walk around in a circle. I soon got tired of watching their funny antics and sent a rifle bullet in among them, which had the effect of breaking up the meeting and killing one of the brethren. One time when hunting in the mountains I ran across two little bear cubs curled up in a hollow stump, asleep and as the mother bear was not around to offer any objections, I captured them, put them in my pack basket, and carried them home. I shut them in a shed a little way from my house and left them there. That night, along toward morning, I was awakened by a terrible racket out in the shed where my baby bears were confined. I conjectured that the mother bear had come for her young, and I was not mistaken. For looking out, I could see by the pale light of the moon that she was there, tearing around that building like mad, and the cubs were scratching and whining inside, trying to get out to her. My heart was touched with pity for the little things. I made a noise to frighten the old bear away so she would not harm me, and I went out quickly and released the little ones, and off they scampered to join their parent. I could have easily killed the old bear, and the bounties from her and the cubs would have netted me a nice little sum of money, but I did not have the heart to do so. The End
End of section five. End of Stories from the Adirondacks by Albert A. Young. Recording by Roger Moline.